right, so we are live. Turn my volume down. <clears throat> And we just typically give it a minute or so for a couple people to join. So where are you actually located at right now? I live in, in California. Okay, I'm in the area. So all those fires that you've been hearing about in the news, <laughs> I'm like, there's one on the Santa Cruz mountain side and there's one in the kind of the foothills side and I'm at the base of the foothills. Oh, <laughs> so okay. We, uh, we just had our evacuation warnings lifted. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's been kind of a little too smoky to be doing anything mm -hmm. outside, but, um, and thankfully it's not as hot as it was. Right. It's mm. Super hot. Has the beaches reopened in California? Um, I don't actually know. Has the beaches reopened? Do you know? You were bold with that one. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know actually. Live now, live now. <laughs> I crawl by the first time. <laughs> um I don't know. Uh I haven't personally been to the beach. Um okay. and I I'm I think San Francisco has been pretty strict with the beaches. Okay. Um like I don't I think it's not as strict in other parts of of California, I think okay. in Southern California, I think they're a little more open. Um, but LA beaches, are open. LA beaches are open. He just looked it up. LA beaches are open. Okay. Yeah, I think Orange County are as well, aren't they? Oh, he already clicked. Okay. <laughs> Orange County is open as well. He just closed it. He didn't look at that. Oh, one. wow. Okay. I'm guessing it is. I feel like I've seen. Yes. Have yours. We're just going to give it a few moments to give a couple of people time to join in. Right and on. then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. I forgot. Where are you located? I didn't ask you. We are in Pennsylvania. Um, Reading area. I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, Pennsylvania. I feel like I know somebody from Reading. We're near uh, Philly. Yeah. Four minutes. Yeah. And, and 45 minutes an hour. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, I, I'm sure California is more exciting than <laughs> <laughs> where we're looking. Yeah. Yeah. It's can, all relative, uh, right? Like I'm living, yeah. I'm living in a kind of a sleepy area in the mm -hmm. Bay Area. So <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot going on where I am, but, uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, the weather's nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. All right. Well, thank you viewers for tuning in to Uncommon Women. I'm Shanira. And I'm Jenny Lee. And before we actually get started on today's topic, uh, we have our guest, uh, Dr. St. John. She's going to be speaking on sex education today, um, educating the parents, you know, with the talk with our children. Um, but before we get into that, we just want to let you know who we are and what we actually do. So we're an uplifting podcast. Um, we focus on two things. Uh, we have people that come on and share their trials and tribulations. And then we also have guests uh, come on and educate us in regards to um, a specific topic. Uh, so today we're actually going to be speaking on sex education. Um, and we have Dr. St. John um, here today that's going to assist us with that. So thank you so much for tuning in today <laughs> uh, to tell you a little bit about um, Dr. St. John. Um, She's known as a Mama Sutra, a board certified sexologist with American College of Sexologists and a former professor of human sex sexuality at City College of San Francisco. Um, she's an author of Read Me, a, a parental primer for the talk. She does have that handy. So make sure you guys check that out. Um, and she's named multiple years in the top 100 sex blogging superheroes by kinky.com. 
<laughs> um, so before we actually go in today's topic, um, Dr. St. John, is there anything that you would like us to know about yourself? Let's see. Um, so I am, I'm a mother of two. I have two daughters. They're 16 and 18 years old. Um, I was married for, I was with my husband for 20 years and got divorced okay. and uh, went through adulthood a second time around dating. <laughs> so that was interesting. And that was sort of at the same time as when I went back to study sexuality. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you can imagine after a while, I didn't tell people that I was a sex educator <laughs> dating profile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a mistake. <laughs> so, um, but actually the, the partner that I have now, we've been okay. together seven years and, um, yeah, I, I, when we first met our first date, I just said I was an educator, right? Which sounds okay. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> so I just said I was an educator and he didn't say anything, right? It was like, oh, okay. And then I think it was like our third or fourth date. I took him with me to a book signing of a colleague's book. And it was okay. a sex book. <laughs> and so, so what was the re his reaction? <laughs> okay, so, so he's German. He's from, he grew up in East Germany, uh, in Berlin, and Germans are very different about sex. And this, this kind of ties into kind of my story of why I got into mm -hmm. learning about sex and, and specifically focusing on the parenting aspect. But his response was, was actually one of the things that made him extra appealing to me because every other person I'd met who was, you know, more of an American descent was like, you know, <laughs> kind right. of smarmy. And his response <laughs> was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, which was super like reassuring to me that he wasn't going to be weird or creepy or whatever. It. It was just going to be a, you know, it's just, oh, okay. But, um, but yeah, so he's, he's German and his response was just, okay. So yeah, so we're still together. <laughs> So he's, he's very, very supportive. Okay. Very supportive. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's been very supportive of the work that I do and, and uh, has been lots of fun to, to explore with as well. Because mm -hmm, <laughs> Germans, Germans don't have a lot of hangups. I mean, as a general rule, I don't think I've met a German who's had a lot of hangups about, about sex. They're just, they're very open. There's mm -hmm. how the culture is around sexuality and, and about the body. Um, I um. I've gone to Germany a few times, okay. you know, I live there as well. And that was part of where um, I discovered that I wanted to teach about, eh, it actually wasn't where I wanted to teach about sex, but I got to see how the German culture was very different around sexuality because I had two toddlers. Um, I lived there for five years with my ex-husband uh, when we were still married. And yeah, in, in Germany, little kids run around during the summer in the fountains in the local public parks completely naked and what? no one reacts yeah it's 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 a remarkable thing really because it's your body the, it's your body and there's these little cherub bodies are not sexual right like they're not they're not curious at that age yet what do what do i mean <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's it's mostly the reactions of the adults right like um i would take my kids to the public pool and the little toddler pool at the public pool in Germany, kids were running around naked and no one said anything. No one, you know, like put some clothes on your kid or anything like that. It was just right. very, you know, they're kids. Open. Right. Very, very open about their bodies. Um, and it was that first summer back that I moved back to the States that I realized, you know, I took my kids to the pool that first summer we moved back, they were three and five and I taught them how to change into their swimsuit at a private pool, like a semi-private pool while they were wrapped in a towel. And the same bodies like a few months before could be totally naked and no one was gonna care. And so I noticed that there was a big difference. <laughs> you know, my natural reaction to being in the States, living and growing up in the States and then bringing my children back, I knew that I needed to dress them in a, you know, wrap them up in a towel, they couldn't, be naked in public. So right. That's yeah. Interesting. Because that's not our norm here. No, it's not. <laughs> not, not at all. 
Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so it's a, it was a really interesting thing. And so that was um, around that time. Um, I went back, I started to go back to school to study human sexuality. Um, I went to a, a small school, small private school. It doesn't exist anymore, sadly. Um, but it was called the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's, um, it was a very non-traditional school. Um, but it was really very, very groundbreaking, very eye-opening and lots of, you know, wonderful educators and, and writers around the topic of sexuality graduated from that school. So, so that was my, that was where I went. <laughs> That's awesome. So how did you actually get started in, you know, becoming a, a professional sexologist? <laughs> <laughs> So, well, the beginning of it was, was going to the Institute. Um, My kids were very young. They were in preschool and I knew I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to do something for myself after, you know, a few years of being a stay at home mom, expat parent in Germany. And I just Googled graduate program, human sexuality. And I happened upon this tiny school that was based out of San Francisco. And San Francisco has a pretty, um, a pretty amazing history around sex. Like it's, hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great place. And going to that school, um, the very first semester really was, um, there was a, a lecture from an educator who I very much respect. Her name is Ivy Chen. And she came in and talked to us about sex and, and, like the pair, um, like the adult, how am I trying to say child, and adolescent sexuality aspect. Okay. And for me, that was like, that is exactly what I want to talk about. That's exactly what I want to learn about. But as a, you know, a board certified sexologist, I know a little bit about everything, mm-hmm. <laughs> what people do sexually and how they think and feel about it. It's just a piece of the work that I do is, is the parenting piece. Mm -hmm. but the client work that I do is, is just with adults. And it's really helping adults get comfortable with the topic because I find that if you have trouble talking to your partner about sex, you're definitely going to have problems talking to your kids about sex. And so those things, you know, they, they really go together. If you can Mm -hmm. get comfortable and actually on my website, I even say, um, if you can get the sex you want, you'll get the life you want. Mm -hmm. And a really, a lot of that comes from if you can get comfortable asking for what you want sexually and, and really just ex, you know, expressing your boundaries or whatever, like you can right. get comfortable about that. You're going to get comfortable about everything. Like mm-hmm. it just, it just makes everything so much easier. If you can take away either the stigma or the shame or the embarrassment or, you know, any of that negative messaging that we got around sexuality. It's more open. Like just, yes. Yeah. Just be more open. And it's interesting because having raised my kids like this in a, you know, sex positive household, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, it's been really interesting to see and to witness their decisions around sexuality. Um, I'll give you an example. I've gotten permission. I'm sure they come to you about everything then, right? Yeah. So (laughs) So when you are open with your kids, it it sure it it shifts the relationship honestly Mm -hmm. because when you're being real with them they know that you have their best interests at heart right Mm -hmm. and like i know from experience when parents lie to you there's there could be a couple reasons for that right they're they want to protect you right Mm -hmm. they want to keep you safe Mm -hmm. um but lying when kids find out that it's a lie like uh, you don't trust like, you yeah. as much, they don't right? Trust they you don't. as much, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so my kids have they've had me as a sex educator, and you know, it's I don't know what how to describe what it's like to be in this house <laughs> because we we talk about like sexual jokes or like anything that sort of comes up, and we'll laugh about it mm-hmm. because sex is funny. The topic is funny, and at the same time like we don't have the, the fear um, or the shame about it. So 
laughing about it. We know it can be serious and we can, we can be serious about it, but mostly it's, I mean, it is a funny topic, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so the thing I wanted to share my, my daughter a couple of years ago now, we were having a conversation, can't remember how it started, but this was my older daughter. And she okay. said, you know, when I decide that I'm ready to have sex, I'm going to find somebody that I'm totally comfortable with. I want to find somebody that I'm really comfortable with. And I was like, that's really interesting. Why do you, why do you say that? And she said, I get the sense that sex is awkward and I want to find somebody that I'm totally comfortable being awkward with. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Like 30 something year old me did not <laughs> Right, like twenty something year old me. Is awesome, yeah. Like the 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 thought that kids can put through with this topic. I mean, they can be mature about it if we treat them and, and approach it in a mature way. And yeah. to be fair, though, it is so hard when when our parents didn't know how to handle it, or yeah. we sat through sex ed that was awful or mm -hmm. uninformed, yeah, yes. uncomfortable, yes. very uncomfortable, very <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so there's, there's like this, there are barriers in the way for us and that it's, it's tough to get over them, but there are sex educators out there like me who, who love to do this. You know, we love to help people break these things down and really look at it and ask questions. So, you know, that, that answer or that, what is it? The sort of her conclusion was really mature, way more mature than even adult me <laughs> would have come up with. And yeah, it's, it really is just like talking to kids, you know, making sure that the topic isn't something that's, that's scary. Right. Um, and I get it, right. We want to keep our kids safe. We don't want creepers interacting with them or, you know, targeting them. I think yeah. One of the words is grooming, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Grooming or luring. Right. Um, heaven forbid that happen. Um, but we know that if we give kids the right information to be able to keep themselves safe, right? Yeah. You know, the right that that helps them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that keeps them safe is um, giving them the proper names, the parts of the body, right? Like that, that's like a beginning level piece that you can do. Okay. Um, it's, um, yeah. So, so I wrote in the book, I called them the five building blocks to a healthy sexuality. And if anything that people get out of the book is I've, I've taken out the sex part, which is kind of radical for a sex book, <laughs> right? The sex part is what scares us as parents. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole lot of stuff that impacts us having a healthy sexuality. And I called uh, the five building blocks I named are communication, mm -hmm. consent, respect, pleasure, and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And those five things don't have anything to do with, you know. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> But they're a foundation. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it of, is. Yeah, it that is. Makes sense. And it, it takes out needing to talk about penises and vulvas and all that jazz. Right. But it makes it, it, it breaks it down to these little bite-sized pieces, these pieces that you wouldn't necessarily think on, you know, off the top of your head, but they do have an impact on our adult sexuality, on our sex lives as adults. Yes, mm -hmm. right. That's true. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, each one of those blocks has like subcategories. There's tons of information in each one of those blocks. And yeah, it's, it's been, um, it's what helped me talk to my kids and do it in ways that, and the questions that I ask them are, not necessarily about you know who does what and what goes where 
Mm -hmm. but it gets them thinking about what's out there and what they're being fed right yeah. that's real good yeah so you know what is sexy right like if I asked my kids when they were really little I think I wrote about that one in the book um and when my littlest she didn't have the words to articulate what sexy was but she did this like 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 she puckered her lips and like you can mm-hmm. picture like a, a toddler doing this right like a little, <laughs> a little one she was like she did this like jessica rabbit like <laughs> mm-hmm. she did these moves and i was like okay well that's sexy you know like, mm-hmm. that's, that's what's sexy mm-hmm. and so i was laughing about that with them recently now 16 and 18 and reminding them of of that interaction and we started talking about so what's your definition now right mm-hmm. and perspective yeah too. it is especially you know from being <laughs> as a being child, an adult too yeah, like <laughs> very different. what is sexy right and so then the question is whose definition of sexy is that right That's the media is sexy because <laughs> what i find sexy you know like <laughs> might not be what everyone else thinks is sexy right Mm -hmm. right and that's totally valid and i think you know a lot of the messaging around sex is it has to look a certain way or it has to be a certain way yeah Yeah. that's a good usually it's very hetero focused um there's like conventionally beautiful right Mm -hmm. that's how what we're supposed to like um and it doesn't allow for like the variety of beauty that is there right okay that sounds feels like it's getting a little cheesy but (laughs) no but that's that's true because what you might think is sexy is maybe a different perspective perspective for me and it might need even not even be a parents yeah 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 so we were so we were laughing about that that you know the, the past sexy definition and then like even at this age, both girls were like, whoa, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's deep. You know, like, who is that? Who is it for? Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I geek out on this stuff. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. No. You're, you're the expert. So yeah. I got a whole bunch of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I <definitely> do. <laughs> so what do you feel like is a good age, you know, to start, you know, even trying to have this conversation with your kids? Yeah, so I think about this one. Um, This one can be tough, right? Because when our kids are ready, we might not be ready. Right. (laughs) So one of the ways to kind of prepare yourself, um, if you're fortunate to catch this when your kids are are babies, right? So if there are any new moms out there, um, you can start using the proper names for the parts of the body when you change diapers. You know, you can, you can just name the penis. Oh, I'm going to wipe the urine off the penis, you know, or off your penis. You can just sort of narrate what you're doing, but using the proper names. And the reason for that is it gets less uncomfortable. It gets more comfortable, I should say, when you just use the words on a, you know, like on a, usual normal daily basis so then when you need to say it later it's less like vulva (laughs) uncomfortable right yeah Mm -hmm. okay that makes sense so so you know being able to talk about the parts of the body so then the kids develop you know this their nose it's just it's 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 part of the body right and vulva penis just a part of the body and there's no shame about that um that's kind of what I was digging at or, or hinting at earlier when I talked about, you know, using the proper parts of the body, because if heaven forbid a child is um, a target of unwanted sexual yeah. contact, yeah. they can name the proper part as opposed to where they down touch. there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. So, so yeah, so it, it benefits the child. Um, as far as like specific age, um, you can 
let your child lead when they start asking questions is when you start to answer. So sometimes um, it, it varies with age because every child's going to be different. Um, but some kids start to ask when somebody's pregnant. Mm-hmm. Right? That's where we all started. Nope. <laughs> that nope. is so true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so when they see somebody pregnant, they might start asking. But the, the thing to know is sometimes they don't necessarily want to know. Like you have to be mindful of their questions too. Um, there's a, a joke. Well, it's not even really a joke, but it was, it was sort of a funny incident that happened to, to someone else where the son asked, where did I come from? And mom got really sort of like, oh boy, this is the moment. And like went into the whole detail about <laughs> like where babies come from. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the kid's eyes were kind of glazing over, but then when it finished, they said, oh, well, so-and-so came from San Francisco General Hospital, right? Like, <laughs> where'd you come from? Is it, can be a really <laughs> <laughs> could have saved a whole you know, right, stressful whole conversation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> tell me more what do you why do you ask you know oh well mm-hmm. then so and so was born at the, you know they came from the hospital oh well, okay so that's a very different conversation mm-hmm. <laughs> I go to the hospital so that you can be born <laughs> then it's a right, <laughs> different conversation so um so yeah it's it's following the kids leads um when they're ready, when they're asking is when they're ready. Um, you may find that kids don't ask, mm-hmm. right? So then how do you start the conversation? Yeah, where's the icebreaker yeah. on yeah. that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So an icebreaker on that can be, you know, whatever you want to use. So maybe, I guess it depends on the kid's age too. So, um, you know, let's say, let's say they're 10 and some kid in class has just stumbled on porn. Oh, yeah. Right? That is so a, that'll be yeah. that'll be an interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that that could be another that could be a point where you start to have a talk about pleasure or and and that's actually mentioning that's pleasure. A good topic. Can you talk can we can we go into that? Yeah. So pleasure and fantasy are two of the blocks that can be tough for parents. But when you break them down, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. So pleasure is, um, pleasure is much more than sexual pleasure, right? If you take a hug, for example, like this, the concept of a hug, when you really need one, it can bring tears. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And when you you know, when you're really upset, a hug can soothe tears. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so much, I, I, it's, it's adults, but it's not just American adults, but a lot of adults will sexualize touch, but just touch is, is soothing. It's deeper. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, just the, the concept of pleasure. Um, I've sort of been struggling with this one lately too, because the things that we enjoy when we're seven years old or like pre preteen, a lot of those things that we used to do as hobbies or, you know, our special interests, we used to draw, or we used to dance. Those are things that are, are really key to self care, right? And mm-hmm. now that we're in quarantine, people have been sort of struggling with like, you know, how do I, how do I calm myself down? Mm-hmm. Because it's, I mean, it's stressful. It's uncertain. It's, you know, all kinds of stuff going on right now. Right. So being able to know, like, what gives me pleasure? Can, you know, it can also be very soothing for myself to be able to self-regulate how, what can I do to calm myself down? What do I enjoy doing? So pleasure is, is not just sexual pleasure, but helping mm-hmm. kids to identify, you know, what do you enjoy? What do you, what do you like? What gives you pleasure? It's, it's more than just the sexual pleasure. 
So, mm -hmm. and then the fantasy one, I go into a lot of detail in this, in both of these in the book, but the fantasy one, I guess the bottom line for this one is, um, if we're not teaching or talking to kids about the concept of sex and sexuality, we at least have to talk to them and make them make it clear that what we see out there is someone else's fantasy about sex. Okay. That's going to be hard. Yeah, it is. Right? Like, I mean, it's, it's like, um, well, I mean, porn is typically made for men by men, you know, money shot. It's like mm -hmm. all of it is, is fabricated, uh, to be arousing. Um, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's questionable, uh, <laughs> but it's it's made and you know you don't learn how to drive by watching fast and the furious videos that's no. true no you don't that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't learn about sex from watching porn porn because it's it's not real you know i mean there is some porn out there that's good and that's real like there's some educational the stuff that that's sort of like more on the educational side yeah. Um, and there's a website called make love, not porn TV, which is like a, how do I describe that one? It's, it's not crowdsourced, but it's, eh, can't say that it's really like, it's basically real people mm -hmm. submitting their own sort of home video. Some of it might be, okay. you know, produced, but they're real couples really interacting and they get paid when people watch their videos. So it's like, what do you call, uh, what do you call that when you when a person gets paid for their work <laughs> as opposed to like you porn, right? I don't watch porn. Users. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like Sorry. users supposedly. <laughs> but... <laughs> Listen, we're not educated on that. <laughs> Maybe one of our viewers might know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, somebody <laughs> drops it in the comments. It's, it's, right. It's, I'm thinking it's it's not crowdsourced, but it's something like that, right? Okay. The people who are doing it or are using it are submitting their own work as well. And they they have followings, right? Like oh, wow. people have Is it the fan bases. Of the fan thing? I think I've seen that. Is that something you can you fans? Oh wait, you mean like only fans? No, it's different oh, from no. that. Okay. It's okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, OnlyFans. Um, there was a there was a quick uh, a bit of hubbub this week because Bella Thorne went on and made some promises oh, I've seen of some. That. I've seen that. Uh, she well, she screwed over sex million. workers who were. <laughs> Say again. Wow. I've seen that. I think she made a million in twenty four hours. I thought it was two million in two two days. Oh, okay. Yes. But yeah, so she got caught. But what happened was the backlash of that sort of bait and switch that she tried to pull ruined it for people who were using it for money-making purposes. And, mm -hmm. you know, the funny thing is all these years of like men and revenge porn and taking women's images and, you know, blackmailing them or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like extorting them, I should say. And whereas now women in an empowered way can sell their images and like men are kind of cut out of the <laughs> cut out of the uh the deal right mm -hmm. so they're a little bitter about that too <laughs> but but yeah seriously she she screwed over sex workers by or people who who make money legitimate money selling their images on the internet so so now there's like all kinds of restrictions and, and we're going off on a little bit of a tangent, but yeah, we are. I'm I didn't, sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. So let's bring it back. We were talking about kids and porn. Bring it back. So how, so you're saying, all right, say a 10 year old comes home and they're discussing porn. How do, how will we That's start we the started. conversation in regards to that? Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that I just recently put on my website is a Mad Lib sort of style script on okay. how to start the conversation, right? And there are blanks in there that can that you can fill in with whatever whatever words fit for you. Okay. But it's basically like, okay, I want to sit I wanted to sit down with you for a while. Okay. But I felt whatever. 
-hmm. And I know it's important for you to know this. Uh, you know, I think it's it, the number has gotten, I forget what the average or what the number is, but most kids now will have their first exposure to porn at around 10. I think it might even, even have dropped to nine, age nine now. What? But so, so it's, my... yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So the conversation is like talking to them about how, um, or at least how I did it with my kids. And I talk about it in the book as well okay. is I laid it out and said, there are things you can't unsee, right? Mm -hmm. There are going to be, if you Google boobs, <laughs> there are going to be things you can't unsee. Um, going to, you can even use that Fast and the Furious thing because they probably know that, know of right. the Fast and Furious movies. Like you don't learn about how to drive a car by watching those movies. It's supposed to be just entertaining. So the same thing goes with, with porn, it's supposed to be entertaining, but for an adult, right? Like that, okay. it's certainly not educational. Um, okay. It may, it may ruin sex for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, if you're watching it at, like, like as an eight or nine year old, like at that age, sex is icky, right? Right, right. When you're eight or nine years old, like you, you know, you see right. adults kiss and you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So this idea that um, letting kids see it when they're, when they're really young, it's not, they're not necessarily ready for it. Um, and so, you know, you could even say, uh, if you're curious, please ask me. I, if I don't know the answer, I will go find it for you. But I guarantee going to the internet and just Googling it, it's, you're not going to find what you're looking for. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> not as a kid, right? Like, leave it to me. I'll, you know, tell me, I'll research it and I will get back to you. And then you have to get back to your kid. Okay. You can't just like hope they're going to forget about it. I mean, they may forget about it, but they're also going to learn that you're not somebody they can ask. They can talk to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's real good. So, okay. So that's a good point in regards to how to introduce it to children. Um, how do you feel about sexual behaviors in children? Like what's normal and what's not normal at a specific age? Yeah. Like for instance, my son is 12 and like he wakes up or he walks around in his boxers and he's always, you know, hard. So it's yeah. like, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm assuming that's normal, but it's like, how do I talk to him about certain things you can't do, you know? Well, so, so just the physiological stuff that's happening, it's, you know, it's pretty, yeah, it's, pretty, <laughs> it's not, I mean, as much as I'm sure he would hope, there's not much he can do about it. Right. When he gets a boner in class. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So I guess, um, I mean, I think the thing that we, that I wish somebody would have done for me is to have a little more, com to have compassion about what's going on, right? Yeah. And to be compassionate with each other because getting a boner in school can be really embarrassing, right? And that's yeah. just something that's naturally happening at that age. But what's also happening is girls can be getting their periods. Periods, yeah. And, right. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the embarrassing thing for periods for girls can be if they spot and they don't realize it. Right. Yeah. Okay. And having like teaching compassion, teaching our kids, regardless of their gender, like maybe you loan your friend or loan doesn't even have to be somebody that's your friend, right? You notice that they spotted and you can come up and like give them your jacket or whatever and say, I noticed that you're you're spotting uh, or your period's coming through and I'm just giving you my jacket to tie around your waist to hide, you know, to, <laughs> so, you, so nobody will notice, right? Cause they may not mm -hmm. have noticed, but that's something empathetic or like compassionate or empathetic that any kid of any age could do for somebody else. Right. right. And the same, okay. same thing, like when a boy gets a boner, regardless of who it is, don't laugh at him. It's traumatic yeah. enough to be, you know, it's embarrassing. Like no. just, right. just, just make them uncomfortable and embarrassed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause all that does is like, it just perpetuates us being mean to each other around this 
natural thing that's just happening to our bodies what we have no control over and that sucks <laughs> mm-hmm yeah, that's good. So, but yeah, in terms of like sexual behaviors, um, I mean, not talking to kids. I, I think most people think that if you talk to your kids about sex, they're going to go out and do it. But the research does, does not support that. Not mm -hmm. talking to your kids usually has kids go out and try to figure it out for themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like the sexual exploration kinds of things, sometimes if it's hap if it happens, um, usually they're around the same age, um, and it's usually there's no penetration. There's no. Um, it's just sort of like, like playing doctor. Like I'm curious about what you have or how you're you may be different from me, right? Yeah. So it's 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 more curiosity than than sexual. Okay. Um, and so where there's where there can be sometimes a problem is if there's an age difference um or a, a, a difference in mental capacity okay um and typically kids who have comprehensive sex ed uh when they do start becoming sexual they do that typically with people of their own age okay and Typically, they use protection. Um, so they're, they're, they're doing it in an, in an informed way. And usually that age is, is on the older end. Okay. Um, like kids who have gone through comprehensive sex ed have been taught to think through the values that they have around sex, okay. um, the consequences of sex, right? Like they, they learn it as opposed to just being told, oh, don't have sex. You're going to get pregnant. Right. Like, yeah, that's, that's always yeah, the term. Yeah. It's not yeah. going to happen to me. Right. No, it's not helpful at all. Yeah. True. So yeah. So making sure they have good sex ed helps them make like my daughter, like, like they think it, they think about it and they consider like, is this for me? Is this really what I want? Yeah. And my goal, my wish, my greatest wish for my kids is that they, when they're ready, find that they, they get to do what they want with whom they want in a conscious way. Like, I don't want alcohol or drugs. Cause that, that'll, that's a whole other battle. Whole other yeah, right. whole, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've known adults who couldn't have sex without being altered either on drugs or alcohol. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, I feel like that tends to be like, it becomes our pattern, right? We get high, yeah, right. we go have sex, we get drunk, we go have sex. And then we like, mm -hmm. don't have to think about the consequences of why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, the conversations I had with my kids about sex, I also had conversations with them about drugs and alcohol. And I mean, the stuff that we talk about is like, uh, my mom didn't talk to me about, <laughs> about mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Right. But how I think about it is if you can take your emotion out of it, like just remove your own, like, and I'm not perfect at this. Like I, I have my own <laughs> with my daughter being 18. Now you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. But, um, you have a 19 year old boy. <laughs> so, you know, but like, if I can like, take my emotion out of it and just address whatever the question is or the concern is in an informed and calm patient way. Yeah. Like we connect yeah. on a, on a different level because mm -hmm. she, she trusts me. Right. Yeah. And ultimately I just want to, I just want to be a good source of information so she can make she's gonna do whatever she's gonna do right like mm -hmm. eventually we can't control them right as much as we'd want to yep we just have to be comfortable Educate with them, right them, <laughs> no <laughs> that's it we just have to make sure they've got the right knowledge so they can make good decisions because they're gonna be on their own at some point yeah for sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> And I, you know, going back to what is, a, what is an appropriate age, 
mean, these lessons that I talk about in the book are really all through their, their elementary school, middle school, high school okay. ages, because talking to a kid about consent when they're two benefits them when they're 12 and they're starting to get into That's like, yeah, right. Right. Okay. And it's definitely helpful when they're 22. Okay. That's yeah. real good. Do you want to ask one of your questions? Uh, yes. What would happen to a child if sex isn't spoken to them? Like, what would happen? Like, well, obviously we have experience. <laughs> I was going to say, I have experience. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so there's, there's a few ways it could go, right? Because not every kid who doesn't get sex ed is going to do this. Mm -hmm. But um, they may. Okay, so I'll tell a personal story. So when I was growing up, I was told men only want one thing, but nobody talked about what the one thing was. Interesting. Mm. So here I was growing up thinking men only want one thing. What is it they want? I don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I should ask my mom this because I don't remember going through sex ed in high school. I'm okay. pretty sure she kept me home. <laughs> i got the i got the sixth grade period talk uh-huh okay okay and i don't remember anything after that and i went to public public school i grew up in iowa i don't remember them being like particularly she probably signed I mean, this paper was, for her not to have the talk yeah mm -hmm. yeah so nobody talked to me um i i was a good girl um i didn't i didn't do anything with anybody like kissed i think like one of those Sadie Hawkins type stances where like the girl <laughs> had to ask the guy. Um, right. I was, a, I was a total dork, right? Like, <laughs> um, and I just, I, you know, my parents sort of like fed me the, you're too busy to date. And I thought, oh, I'm too busy to date, right? Okay, I'm too busy. And I was active in a lot of activities, I, you know, things in school. Mm -hmm. um, but then I went to college and I went away for college and like, I got to see how other people were interacting and like making different choices. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I started drinking with all the college kids and I made some really bad decisions. Um, my, yeah, I mean, you can read about it in the book <laughs> or you can read about it on my website. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I made a series of not so great decisions as a result of not having good sex ed. Um, when I was, I think it was either a junior in college or might've been sophomore year. I don't remember which year it was, but I took human sexuality and I was like, just my mind was blown because <laughs> right. no one talked about, you know, and it was this, um, for me, it was a, even though no one talked to me about it, I was so comfortable talking to other people about it. And people would ask me sex questions and I would answer them because now I had this class behind me. And so I kind of knew some stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like somehow, you know, the world being or whatever, like past lives, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. somehow this topic for me was like super easy and it just it when people started to talk to me and explain things to me like it made so much sense and so I think I think we harm kids when we don't tell them the truth we we put them in harm's way we okay. make it potential we put the potential in place for kids to be harmed because we don't talk to them okay I think if we gave them information that was good information and, and trusted that they were going to make good decisions. You know, I mean, we, we, it all comes down to trust. We have to be able to trust right. that our, yes. you know, that our kids are going to do what's best for them, mm -hmm. but also making sure to talk about values and the consequences and, and the real stuff um, is super important. And it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be ignored. Because okay. even, even just the talking about sex part, like you kind of don't really 
have to talk about sex, but I really think these five building blocks, being able to talk about dating, love, relationships, those are the things that are supposed to happen Mm -hmm. before sex, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, if you're talking about, okay, so what do people do when they date? Why do they date? What are they looking for? Mm -hmm. Um, What is it like to be in love? When do you know you're in love? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the relationship part. So what is a healthy relationship? What's an unhealthy relationship? Mm-hmm. Can you, have you seen unhealthy relationship examples in your friends' relationships? That's you great. know, have you seen them? Have you seen examples in movies? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause it's all around us. Yeah. 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 But I, yeah. I think the, the focusing on sex part can sometimes it's coming from a sexologist. It's not great. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It shouldn't be our only focus. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen before. I mean, we know adults have sex without really thinking through mm-hmm. <laughs> stuff, yeah. but to help people really develop good decisions, there's, there's stuff that they need to think through and, and they shouldn't just take it as like, Oh, Tinder, you know, I just want to <laughs> swipe left, <laughs> find somebody to, you know, to screw to or what relationships. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. That's it's, good. that's the stuff that like, if you can't talk about sex, talk about relationships, talk about love, talk that's about that, dating. Yeah. So healthy relationships mm-hmm. yep. is a good start. It is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and like, that's, that's it. That's really good. So instead of just going right into the birds and the bees with children that's hitting puberty and we want to know like do they have a girlfriend or do they have a boyfriend we can we can start off in regards to like dating yeah or how they feel about a relationship and things like that okay I like that. yeah I mean look at I don't like that the friend zone has been made this terrible thing mm-hmm. because if you look at what my daughter said, finding somebody that you're really comfortable with mm-hmm. should not be a bad thing. Right. Like to find somebody that you that you like hanging out with. And to be fair, there's plenty of media of the bad boy, right? Like that's mm-hmm. the one you should go after. Like, yeah, please <laughs> <laughs> show me a good bad boy <laughs> in a relationship, right? Right. <laughs> I, I've been there, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what does a bad boy look like in a relationship? Mm-hmm. A healthy relationship. If we focus back on some mm-hmm. healthy relationships, mm-hmm. I like, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Take yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that's a, a freebie in the book, in the back of the book, there's a, a link to a website or a, a page on my website. You cannot Google for this page because it's hidden <laughs> except to people who get the book and find this page. But I have a free downloadable list of questions that you can talk to your kids about. That's awesome. So it's a, yeah, it's just, it's a guide and you can find in my blog post if you go to my website and then the little magnifying glass up at the menu bar, click and type Mad Lib because I have that Mad Lib style script. Mm-hmm. So if you want to sit down and talk to your kids and you don't know how to start the conversation, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's set up so that you can fill in your own words or change it however you want. It's just sort of like a guideline, but it shows you. It helps you out too. Yeah, it doesn't have to be so scary. And again, you don't even have to talk about the parts or the bits, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I like the basic, the five points she yeah, focused so on. That's really good. Really yeah, because it's, I mean, I don't think I talk about what does what or who, you know, mm-hmm. I don't talk about that in the book. Um, it, I may talk about the body parts, mm-hmm. right, using the, the proper names. Um, yeah, and, and you can even acknowledge how funny the names are, you know, <laughs> I mean, my kids know, they can, they know the right parts, but they definitely use the, the silly words too, right? Mm-hmm. They understand mm-hmm. that there's they understand the context of being able to say the, the right parts when you're trying to be serious, or they can go to their yeah. you know doctor now at 18 and <laughs> yeah, and, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I just hope that I, I gave this kid, these kids, 
enough information to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think that is important in what you were saying that for them to know the right names because uh, a lot of sexual abuse does happen. Yeah, molestation and, and stuff. a lot of, um, I had read into certain things before where uh, someone was getting, I guess a mother had asked a child um, or a teacher, I can't quite remember what it was. And she's like, well, somebody touched my cookie and the th teacher thought it was a cookie. Mm -hmm. So actually it was some, she was yeah. getting molested because right. that they, they were giving her, instead of just teaching her the right terms, she, was saying it was a cookie mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I think that is very important that a child should know the right terms definitely yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's a good example of why that's good you can go ahead We're i said can sexual abuse lead to sexual issues as a child into adulthood yep yeah. <laughs> i mean short answer yep um and it can be conscious and it can, I mean, it can show up unconsciously, um, mm -hmm. being afraid of the dark. Yeah. Uh, not all, I mean, it doesn't mean that all kids who are afraid of the dark have had something happen to them. Right. Yeah. But, um, uh, like trigger, you know, point, yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. Um, it can. Yeah. And I, I guess it's, um, it would depend on the, the instance or the, you know, what, what you're talking about mm -hmm. um uh it doesn't it's not always a one-to-one -one. doesn't mean that if you have a sexual hang-up that you have you know you've had some abuse okay. um but it can um it's important to if it's um oh actually i can also tell you that even if somebody so says something terrible to you and it didn't, it wasn't like a sexual assault or unwanted sexual contact. Mm -hmm. Somebody says something to you, it can impact you going forward, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say your first sexual partner um, makes a comment about your, about your vulva and says like, makes like, oh, those meat curtains, ugh. that's going to show up later. Like yeah. you're going to, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to want to show a partner yeah. because you're going to be afraid mm -hmm insecure right? about yeah. your body parts mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yep so yeah it it can that's okay. good i had one other question because we're we are cut cutting close well too um how do you, how do you with all with everything going on as far as like the stuff that's on tv and you know puberty and peer pressure and things like that how do you speak to a child in regards to purity? Um, and, you know, just, I mean, maybe I'm just not thinking realistic, but I would like my son to wait, but mm -hmm. I don't yeah, think that's going to happen. So like, how do you speak on that point? Yeah. Like, I know we covered it a little bit in regards to like about relationships, but like, mm -hmm. I don't want him to also like, once he has it go crazy. Cause I've, I've heard a lot of kids do that too. So how do you pinpoint those situations, you know, for them to be obviously safe if they do have sex as well, but not also going into peer pressure. Yeah. So I do talk about that a little bit in that script. And I acknowledge that, you know, some kids might be asexual or some kids might be feeling pressure to do something that they don't want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so being able to help them practice, um, having a voice, because I have, I have female clients, I have male clients who, if they didn't get a chance to really exercise their voice and say what they wanted or what they didn't want, they gave in to something mm. they didn't want to do. Okay. Um, and as far as like the purity piece and, and hoping that he waits, um, I think that's where a good conversation about values comes in. Mm, that's because um, and I actually have a I have a freebie on my website about that too <laughs> and we're going to get to her website information in a moment <laughs> so, I mean, so good. yeah so being able to like I can't say that I knew what my values were about sexuality when I became a parent I needed to do some work mm -hmm. and for me, the value that I have is authenticity. Mm. And it means 
I'm going to have to walk the talk too. Right. Yeah. So if I, if I say that I want to be real and authentic and tell my kids, it means that I'm going to have to be real <laughs> and tell my kids. Yeah. And, and I expect that back from them too, though. So, you know, so we, you know, like every parent, I think we had struggles where they would try to, you know, fib, tell me something that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out really, I mean, through experience that when they, when they lied to me, I would be way more upset than if they told me the truth. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And so my kids learned to tell me the truth because I was way less (laughs) upset by duplicity or by, you know, just not telling me the truth. So authenticity, Mm -hmm. I mean, so if that might be your value, it might not be. And Mm -hmm. so this PDF that I have on my website has, I think, I don't know if it's two or three pages of just words of, of characteristics or values. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you pick like either top 10 or top 15. It's been a while since I've looked at this thing. (laughs) (laughs) And then you, you whittle it down. Like if you really could, if you really couldn't keep all of them, Mm -hmm. which would be the the core. And so you kind of whittle down and you get your core five. And then there are questions to help you think through those five. Okay. But honestly, I mean, kids do listen, they can listen. And when we're being real and upfront and being able to talk about, you know, this could be our hang up because of X, Y, Z, there may be a story behind it that, you know, um, you know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll think of a story, uh, you know, maybe grandma has put a lot of pressure on you to not have sex yourself or like when you were growing up didn't Mm -hmm. didn't want you to have sex and maybe it was because they they had they got pregnant before they got married Mm -hmm. and had to get a right so there's like right there might be yeah Mm -hmm. it does yeah and so there there might be a reason for that okay why that value is so strong but it's getting at why right yeah okay you know, who is it for? Mm-hmm. That's real good. So, <laughs> I like that. So, where can we find your book? Can you give us your credentials and your website? Yeah. Okay. So, you can find me at themamasutra.com. It's T H E M A M A S U T R A. Um, themamasutra.com. The book is available on my website. Or you can get it from Amazon. You can read reviews on Amazon or, or Goodreads. I think there are a handful of, of reviews on there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the website has a lot of content. There's a lot of free stuff that you can find. I mean, mm-hmm. sadly, it's kind of buried. So you have to I should do a better <laughs> job of making sure that's up front. Um, but as I mentioned, like the book itself has a URL inside that tells you, that gives you um, the list of questions. Mm -hmm. um there's a free sample of that and then there's like a longer list that that's paid Mm -hmm. um but the longer list has like 90 some questions and then some advanced scenarios where you can yeah that's really good think through like a role play or not really a role play but like a a scenario to think through um and what else like yeah the mamasutra.com you can find some old videos that i've put on on youtube of of sex questions Mm-hmm. Um, I have a million plus views on my answers on Quora, where people ask me questions about sex and I, sex, love, dating, relationships, and I'm right. answering on there. So there's a few places you can find me. Yeah. And I'll add your uh, website and book information when we uh, post the audio as well. So um, everyone will have all that information handy. Um, I'll add the website to this as well uh, when we finish. Uh, there was something else I wanted to, oh, is there anything before we actually close out, is there anything that you would like parents to know 
um, in regards to educating their kids, I probably want to bring her back for like a sex ed for adults. Yeah. I think that'd yes, be good. Please. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, 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 the stuff we were talking about, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so is there anything that you would like, you know, parents to know in regards to educating their kids? Yeah. There's a couple of things that I talk about in the book um, that'll go into it a little deeper, but the, the idea that when we talk to kids about sex, you can sort of use the same analogy of teaching your kids about the stove. So when they're really little, we just say, don't touch hot, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as they get a little older, we give them a little more information. So they might be tall enough to see the little indicator light that shows that the stove is hot. You can say, don't touch here. This is hot, right? Mm -hmm. so okay. you, and then as they get a little older, you teach them that uh, how to use the stove the right way so they don't get hurt right mm -hmm. sex is the same thing it's you're not necessarily talking about positions or tantra or <laughs> bdsm like the when details of yeah it. okay exactly when they're little it's not appropriate mm -hmm. so you give them the stuff that's appropriate just like you would with the stove so body parts you know then you start to get into i mean they might ask about how where babies come from but they're not asking about <laughs> right they're yeah. not because my son's first question was am i circumcised or am i not circumcised and i was like oh boy like i didn't and we were at applebee's when this happened and the waitress was like, <laughs> over. it was just like the wrong time and i was like i think it's time but i was just like and then i told him i just answered this question i was like i ain't doing nothing else and he was like okay that's what i thought and then i was like okay maybe we should just do a little bit more so it was, it was intimidating <laughs> I, I experienced it. Well, mine was my son brought a book and I, I gave him all this like hot and cold. And I was trying to explain to him what was. Oh, no, the video froze. Right at the beginning of your story, the video froze. Uh oh. Oh no. Uh oh. <laughs> So it looks like right at the beginning of that story, the video froze and the, or the, the connection froze. And now I'm live on Facebook with you all. <laughs> so they're probably trying to log back in. I really wanted to hear that story. <laughs> so let's give it a minute. Um, so I will say the, the book itself has had a couple different covers. Um, the first version, which you may find in some bookstores, looks like this. Um, and we changed the cover mainly because um, the subhead was really the part that was important, This the parental primer for the talk. Um, it's, yeah, that's the important part of the, of the book. That it's, and it's not just for people who have kids or who have kids in their lives. I have some reviews from people who don't have kids yet who have learned a lot about sexuality themselves. So I think I'm gonna sign off. They might not be able to get back on if that connection was severed. So thank you very much to my hosts who invited me on. Thank you so much. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you again for adult sex ed. <laughs> Bye.